Hi, Mage fans. This is your host, Terry Robinson with Mage the Podcast. As we wind down 2022 and enter our fifth season starting in 2023, Mage the Podcast will be going from weekly to every other week, at least for the first few months of the year. This is due to a couple things. I'll be preparing for what is hopefully going to be my last actuarial exam, and that represents several hundred hours of preparatory work that I will need to do in advance of my May sitting for that. Additionally, the next few books we are going to read are huge. We have Lore of the Traditions, Victorian Mage Core, and Dark Ages Mage, both the core book and the supplement, are all pretty big and all pretty dense. And I think those episodes are just better if we have more than two weeks to try and get them in. I will be trying to add additional items to the feed, but I would rather shoot for once every other week and over deliver than to shoot for weekly and then have that chain break. So where is the other time going to? Behind that, Mage the Podcast will be putting our collective energy a little more into producing some Storyteller Vault supplements. I'm pleased to announce that Mage the Podcast has two big publishing projects we'll be doing over the course of 2023. One is an M20 Umbra update a la Book of the Worlds and Infant Tapestries, and we're currently talking about topics to include in the Discord, discord.me slash mates the podcast. This will be a mix of paying mage writers to write sections, giving the opportunity for the community to include some submissions as well as friends of the show, including their work, as well as knitting it together and providing editing. Additionally, the second book I'm going to simply call M30 to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Mage, which will be coming up next year, 30 years after its release in 1993. It'll be a collection of interviews, essays, and snippets from the history of Mage the Ascension. There really wasn't anything to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Vampire or the 30th anniversary of Werewolf, and I think we as a mage community can do something nice. This isn't going to be a core rulebook or anything like that, but we will be timing it for the 30th anniversary of Mage the Ascension's release at Gen Con of this year. As thanks for your support, incremental bits for both of these projects will be published to the Patreon feed, so if you're curious to see how it develops, consider becoming an executive producer. For a mere $3 a month, you'll get all the extra goodies as well as some interview segments that don't make it into the final episodes. Also, before we start today's show, the application I run the audio through for our live recordings absolutely choked and it intermittently breaks up on my end. Since it happened between the microphone and the recording software, the backup was no better. This resulted in periodic gaps in my audio of around a quarter to a eighth of a second, which is just enough to be absolutely annoying. In some cases, I left the gap in if it was obvious what word was being cut out. In other cases, I removed it, whatever made more sense with flow. Uh, Normally, NVIDIA broadcast has made my life easier, but it now appears to be rebellious against me. So apologies for that. It should be fixed in the future. And with that, on with the show. Hi, Mage fans. This is your host, Terry Robinson with Mage the Podcast. And joining me today is co-host Josh Heath. And we're going to talk about bygones. How you doing, Josh? I'm doing well. I'm excited to be talking about things that don't exist and can we can prove they do not exist until someone gives us evidence that they exist. Which happens a remarkable number of times in the world of darkness. So, so periodically, Mage the Podcast does an episode where we go, big game concept, what do? And I think the first one I really did was on the Marauders, where I immediately found out that no two editions agreed on what a Maraud was. And I was thinking on bygones and other mystic creatures and thought to myself, hey, I wonder if that has changed across editions. And boy, howdy. It has. Simply, a bygone is a creature of mid-legend that can no longer live openly due to either being hunted or incompatibility with consensus. Josh, what isn't a bygone? So bygones are not umbrood, so they are not spirit creatures necessarily. Spirit creatures have the ability to materialize out of the umbra into the real world and things like that. Umbrood, not bygones. Hobgoblins. Hobgoblins, that would be another whole episode, Um, but they are quiet related mental construct things. They are not bygones. Other night folk, vampires, I'm telling you, not bygones. They really exist. They are out there. Just go 3 a.m. Anyway, we'll go on from there. If you've got a core book or something like that, not a bygone. Yeah. And and this is partially a practical definition in that you get into really weird places whenever you come up with a definition for it. So like one of the early ones I had was they are creatures that are previously of reality that had to flee for some reason that are not tied to the umbral or the brood courts, which would make changelings bygones 
vampires never gave up a physical body, thus they are not bygones, but the Garu kind of did as being creatures of spirit that regularly engage with the Umbrood that are kind of in some way repelled by reality. So it gets real messy, real fast. And interestingly enough, some werewolves can technically be bygones, particularly if they stay in the umbral long enough, mm-hmm. they become spirit beings, which is nearly the definition that you provided earlier of a bygone. So Garu equal bygones. <laughs> Although it is kind of infuriating reading Umbra the Velvet Shadow, the revised edition, where it's like, oh no, they can totally disembody. I'm like, oh man, how fast? And they're like, they might disembody a little once a year. So right. after 10 years, they're boned. I'm like, mages get 84 days. We get 84. That's it. We get the, the, the 90-day guarantee, and that's it. But then again, I mean, it helps to be kind of tied to Gaia and in an uphill battle that requires constant accounting. So, Josh, what do we know about bygones from 1E? First edition had a large section on bygones of zero words. Did not exist. 1E doesn't use the term. A recent one I've been looking up is the history of resonance as a thing. And across 1E, it took them like five books to agree on what resonance was. The first time it refers to the resonance effect. And then early on, it refers to resonance being a thing that a realm does to you and not that your magic does to yourself, which I thought was kind of interesting. Now in 2E, it is initially listed as a mythic beast that has abandoned its physical form for an otherworldly one. But across 2E, we get some other details. They are listed as living in the natural lands of the Umbra and have come spirits. Natural lands was in capital N and L, never mentioned before or again. They are affected by unbelief, which means that they were natural and maybe unbelief can affect normal creatures. This is kind of an interesting idea that the subconscious magic of humanity is so potent that if we all agreed on it, we could unbelief the squirrel out of existence. That's called extinction, Terry. (laughs) That is a more active process, I would argue, than unbelief, where it's like (laughs) time to unbelief the great, uh, the the, the bald eagle. I'm like, no, DT is not an agent of unbelief, but I have thoughts, but let's continue. uh, Yeah. In one image, it certainly was. It was listed as a term for things that fled reality along with fairies. So I like the idea that bygones refer to a particular exodus that occurred between the sundering and the shattering. So there could have just been a massive exodus where fairies, goblins, dwarves, elves, what have you, all went. And they are known as the bygones that left during the capital E, at least in RPG terms, exodus. And they are listed as maintaining a meet- material form. 2E suggests that even in the Umbra, that Umbrood are not solid unless they choose to be, or unless you done make them solid. And this is just a second edition. So if you're ever like, oh man, what's an what's a bygone? You officially have Josh and Terry's permission to just make something up because almost anything you pick will be endorsed in the canon. Josh, you're a revised fan too. I don't know if you're actually a revised fan or not. What was the revised definition? And I think it kind of expanded then. Yeah. So I want to touch on revised in a second. I want to pin into an idea. If you are a changeling fan for just a second, imagine if unicorns could become changelings. I will stop there. Consider that idea. Run with it in your changeling games. If you wish to all bygones could be changelings. Interesting concept. So, so just the unicorn is, uh, has undergone the unicorn way and has embedded itself into horses. Oh man, that's interesting. Okay. Right. Yeah. There's lots of things you could play with that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That there is a great eagle out there that uh, periodically undergoes the Griffin way or something Mm -hmm. like that. Could be things or even humans that are unicorns and Griffins and Mm -hmm. all these weird things. You could do weird things with that. Anyway, revised. In Revised, the bygone is a legendary and mythical being that includes goblins, zombies, etc. Lots of different things. Basically means anything that could live on this side of the gauntlet, but probably doesn't because of unbelief. So urban legends, we get Mothman, we get Chupacabra, we get all of these things that could be bygone. So this, I feel, is kind of where the term gets solidified like a bygone 
but then we get um, M20. And what are your thoughts on M20, Terry? Uh, M20 both expands and narrows the definition of bygones and defines them as creatures from legend with permanent paradox rarely found on Earth. And the important part to me there is they are in some way affected by paradox. They are rare and they are on Earth. But the interesting thing is it introduces a number of bygones that seem to be growing in quantity. For instance, the black snakes are subterranean creatures that kind of follow oil pipelines and consume the memory of an area destroying its quintessence. We also get the Anokite of Lakota, which are a group of merciless cannibals, the uh, Agamuxa of the Khoi Khoi, who look like human and are merciless cannibals. There are a remarkable number of these that are merciless cannibals. Cannibalism is a human fear, Terry. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> You're like, well, things are going pretty well. Hope no one eats me. <laughs> and I was worried about introducing, uh, there's one that's introduced in Dead Magic 1 that has like 11 syllables. And I'm like, I don't want to recapitulate stereotypes about cannibalism. I should skip this one and then i cracked open gods and monsters and like cannibalism 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 oh, eats dogs that's a weird one cannibalism like <laughs> it's just it's a, it's a big thing that's a reasonable yep. thing don't, mm-hmm. don't don't go don't get eat the other thing that's kind of interesting is we also get things like the jiang shi the hopping vampires we get the incan yamba which to me always felt more like a spirit which is a giant serpentine creature that lives in waters or waterways and creates uh, storms and such we also get the idea that um, yokai may or may not be bygones. And to me, yokai are spirits that happen to inhabit things. I am by no means an expert in any of this topic, but it also introduces this idea that yokai refuse to be in any sort of category that can be explained and that they are all singular entities, which is a storyteller I hate. I also find it ironic in that that is now the defining feature that groups them together, thus preventing <laughs> me they are now in a defined group. M20 also kind of muddies the waters in that it suggests that there are areas where bygones live happily side by side with humans and are accepted. Sure, M20 wanted to do that. Go nuts. This is one of the things where the concept of reality zones has mm-hmm. been sort of present in the game ish throughout the line in various forms, one way or the other. And M20 both defines and fails to define these until some later books that are coming out or have come out. I think there's a technocracy book where someone that I know wrote a thing that kind of defines those a little bit. Will have had been defined. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, And you worked on Gods and Monsters. I did. Did you have a thought going into it or did it? One thing M20 does, especially when it pertains to spirits, is... It makes it messy again, but on purpose. I don't get the sense that the spirit hierarchies, which are deliberately modeled in M20, was a poor design choice. It can make it frustrating for certain people, but uh, one of the ideas we get in the world of darkness is you have the golden rule, which is basically do whatever you want. Then you have the silver rule, which is the umber should be weird. And towards that end, Mage very much muddies that. Do you like that presentation? Do you wish there were more organization? Did you have a thought about what bygone what do when you were working on Gods and Monsters? I definitely prefer the everything's gray and there's no strong definition Mm -hmm. of things. That's for me, the type of storyteller I am, the type of writer I tend to be where I actually enjoy putting in muddied water where something that was maybe previously defined really strongly is no longer because it's more helpful for me, the type of storyteller I am to be like, oh, this is a concept. I can run it in these 17 different ways. That said, I came into Gods and Monsters very late in the process. So I didn't have the same sort of predefined conception that I was pitching necessarily and had to kind of work with things that are already chosen with the type of things that I was doing. I tend to be a fan of there being some kind of broad classification because that lets, even if wrong, characters in game kind of discuss things. And uh, the next bit is kind of the in-world theories of what bygones are. Looking through this, I tend to think of bygones as creatures that started out being on the mundane side of the gauntlet, fled, in some way maintain materiality, are not tied to the umbral quartz or to the broods, and can in some way be on the mundane side again. This gets into weird places like the changelings are bygones. What about angels? Even the definition guy doesn't have a good definition. So within the world of darkness, we have a bunch of theories. Josh, what's one that you have seen? The first one that comes to mind is they're created by mages, right? 
either by order of reason individuals at one point or by i could see a hermetic creating a particular type of homunculi that could be a bygone right like that's a thing so these are mage experiments that are either summoned uh, created by infernal creatures what are demons anyway in this world you know that that is another thing that is never defined well um that creation idea is like a core theory right that's one way of doing that but my preference is this the second one that i'm thinking of which is that they're normal creatures that went extinct but they have strange biology like a unicorn is a bygone because it is otherwise a normal being has a horn that maybe has magic abilities but people just chose to believe that it does not exist did not exist could not exist that seems like an answer right for some of these bygones but then you've got things that are like saber tooth tigers are they a bygone we know they existed in real life like we have fossils and things like that but they could be a bygone because they are normal-ish, but have kind of supernaturally sorts of things. Maybe saber-toothed tigers existed longer as a bygone than they did as a real being. They're essentially unmagical, but could be magical, could be like just enough magic that you're like, hey, a basilisk or a dragon. There are scientific explanations for the things that people associate with them, but they are natural enough that you could be like, hey, this is a thing that could have existed, right? Dragons are able to harness zero point energy and latent momentum of space that allows them to breathe quantum fire, which just sounds cooler, which is why the Bhattacharya character, the Chosen of Agni in, uh, in Scion, I am particularly fond of. Also, the sorry pants suits that she tends to wear. A free promotion for another OPP thing. Uh, yeah, as you mentioned, the Basilisk doesn't... Uh, turn you in stone necessarily, but it does set off a calcification cascade, causing the calcium in your skin to replace the carbon, thus you appear to stone or something like that. And any number of uh, neurological engram reconfigurations could allow the hypnotoad to exist. And, and ultimately, we all just want there to be hypnotoads in our game, I'd say. Officially, Terry, you are known as the hypnotary in my house, and <laughs> I wanted you to know that because... My spouse was like, wow, that guy really has a hypnotic voice. And I'm like, yeah. And, and they were like, you know, I'm going to call him the hypnotary. And so now you know that use the hypnotary in your games as a bygone. <laughs> I, I like the idea that there is a umbrewed voice that is just kind of out there that infects microphones or something like that. And my actual voice is something like this, but this microphone has. So you need to get a Trinity reference in here so we can keep the an Aeon Trinity well, thing. So the the signal is also a very a thing like this is a disembodied voice that's maybe an AI that is uh, collecting assassins to go out and murder people for the greater good. So uh, questionable things for the greater good is a theme I like in Aeon. <laughs> Mage, whenever that happens, they're like, that's bad. And then uh, Trinity is like, but what if? <laughs> what if it was good. Yeah. <laughs> no? There are a few other interpretations we get. One is the idea that spirit creatures are materialized or embodied cultural beliefs. And this is a particular concern for the technocracy. The Engineers Border Corps Division and Neutralization Specialist Corps view bygones as dangerous incursions from other areas of reality. In Dead Magic, we are introduced to the Tishtak Kamuku, which is a realm that is bridged over in the High Arctic, where the Atchen, another thing that kind of looks human that will eat you, is believed to come from and persist. The Dead Magic books are a great source if you want to grab something that is not in the cultural zeitgeist. So if you're tired of zombies and want to include a wetsuit makungtite, you can do that. The problem is with gods and monsters, I'm pretty sure I'm like, eh, someone's made it. There's nothing secretly super offensive in here. Those I would need to do a little bit of Googling first to be like, is sacred? Yes. No. No. Okay. Let's slow down with it. Or alternatively, uh, it's kind of important. I should change the spelling, a few key details, and then uh, 
and then go from there. They could also be the memories of creatures. Uh, we get the idea that the New World Order is concerned about kind of the notion of cultural memory, that if you get enough people that believe something in the same space, it'll kind of become a thing. The syndicate tries to use this to their advantage, um, or they could view it as a sign of mass psychosis. The appearance of a, a Kilin or a Phoenix as a sign in the population is being disrupted by superstitionists or something in, in some space is disrupting the local newosphere. I like the idea in a technomantic game, accumulating enough paradox starts letting bygones through. And now you're dealing with the fact that your magic used to deal with other problems is causing problems of its own. And that kind of weird indirect paradox, I think is highly suited towards the technocracy. I think the, the last one of these that I think I can think of at least is that uh, the gauntlet rose and then there are supernatural creatures that got stuck here when the gauntlet was like, whoop, yeah. here I am. <laughs> that wasn't there you before. You can't cross me. Yeah. Right. This is fine. Like, this is an interesting view of it. I think this is the most boring one mm -hmm. for me because it removes any agency from either mages or the beings themselves to choose to exist. And it's like... Okay, so if a dragon got stuck on this side of the gauntlet after it rose, how is it not still noticed by people too? <laughs> like it yeah. just has a lot of kind of holes that you could poke into it, but this is an acceptable view where you're yeah. like, ah, oh, well, this is a particular being. I'm thinking about troll, even though they're changing, but I, I use a troll. There are trolls in a traditional Scandinavian mountainside. And they got stuck here because the gauntlet raised. And unlike other true fae, they didn't get knocked into the other side of things. And another way of saying it is they are not those creatures, but those are the descendants of those creatures. The comparison mm -hmm. I will think of is we have any number of lake dwelling or or tidal pool dwelling creatures that is a side effect of a sea level used to be higher, the sea level goes out and instead of living in the ocean, you are now living in a large pond. And if there's a breeding population and there's enough food and so on, you kind of adapt to that. So there are, and this, this I like because it introduces true things. One, there is that hidden dragon that is in the airy mountaintops of the Himalayas. This also suggests that since they are merely the descendants of it out there somewhere in the realm of ash and bone, or in the Ethereum reaches, there are true dragons that are beyond the scope. So this lets us go both ways. We can take a massive spirit entity and figure out what would be the version of it that got stuck in reality. So say, for instance, at one point, Helios literally was embodied and then had to leave part of his essence when departing the material realm when the gauntlet rose and reality could no longer contain him. And now we have the glimmer bug, which are these little motes of sunshine that flit around that just look like another beetle, except for they cause aggravated damage to, <laughs> to darkness aligned creatures or something like that. And then we get to go the other way. So trolls are still running around. What was the Ur troll that they came from? Was it literally a walking mountain? Was mm -hmm. it the embodiment of justice and loyalty? Was it something else? Is it the creature that literally holds mountains in place? And if that creature is woken, suddenly the Appalachians start rising again or something like that. Uh, and that could, that could cause a lot of problems. I love the idea. I'm just pitching this as a plot hook that people should steal. In Mage, that the Appalachian Mountains are sad that they've been disconnected from their other half in Europe. And so they want to recombine. Just take that as an idea and run with it. I think that would be an amazing mage game. If a mountain has this like spiritual desire to reconnect with its roots, what does that do? And I like that as a justification for what Josh is mentioning is the Appalachian Mountains in the eastern United States and the Scottish Highlands were once part of the same mountain range, the central Pangean Mountains. The... Other remnants of it include Greenland and Scandinavia and the Little Atlas Mountains of Morocco. I like the idea that because of this, there are preternatural paths of the wick that allow you to very quickly move between these two. I always like the idea of there being portals that aren't as useful as you wish they were, but are. <laughs> so you're like, yeah, there happens to be a portal that goes from Centralia, Pennsylvania to 400 miles south of Fez, Morocco, directly into the Sahara. So you're like, ah, oh, I wish that were in, I wish both ends of that were in a different, you know what? That's the best we can do. 
are we going to do? Mm. This ties into bygones to just say it is interesting how many myths about mines and the creatures that live within them are very similar from the Pennines in England to the Appalachian Mountains now. Coal miners from those places came. Maybe they just carried those stories. Boring. But that is boring, <laughs> right? <laughs> Cave goblins are a thing. Lots of different like knockers. Those types of beings could be in both places. Interesting story. So now we have the question of what kind of bygones do we want to include? And the first one are those extinct species. Dinosaurs and such are out there and they simply haven't been found yet. They're, they are being protected in some way. But one of the ideas that we kind of get in mage is there are other places you can walk to that are seemingly other realms this is also an idea i like to seal steal from scion where in scion if you want to like the the realm of the celtic undead is listed as across the ocean so you should be able to sail to it like you shouldn't have to have spear three you should just or i mean that could be the focus to your spear three ability but the right people the right boat at the right time in the right place should be able to just sail there and i like that kind of as an idea and one of the big examples we get to that in mage is the idea of the hollow earth which is listed as a place you can literally walk to we get this the stories of the darrow and the goro and the dino nazis that is nazis with dinosaurs not nazis that are dinosaurs leave the dinosaurs out of this they didn't do anything Wrong. So these could exist in the deep Amazon. Look for hidden places or remote play places. The Himalayan Plateau, the interior of Alaska and the Canadian territories, the vast expanses of the Sahara are great places to do this. Don't forget the oceans. We thought coelacanths were extinct. And I thought that was kind of a one-off, but no, we have a long list of things we thought were extinct, but absolutely weren't. I recommend placing megafauna. The Basilosaurus was a 60 foot long intermediate between whales and their land precursors that had a bite that could rival a T-Rex and had three foot long skulls. I think that could add some terror to a water game. Their teeth are the only known material capable of creating a knife fast enough to catch a saber-toothed tiger, say. The Meganeroptus was an insect with a wingspan of 28 inches that look like massive dragonflies and they are vital to the creation of the umbral thopters that are used to move about horizon. The Archaeotherium or hell pigs were cow-sized predatory omnivores and in werewolf I think they were an extinct type of pharaoh. Um, yeah the grandeur okay. are, a, are these were pigs right not necessarily connected to this particular species but could be. But and one of the things they often get is it, it is frequently the case that there are special animals within a culture that when this thing appears something special happens one of my favorite examples of that was there is some religious r ritual that requires a blemish-free white heifer and there are people who are like we could genetic engineer 200 of them what is blemish-free if it's a spiritual thing yeah we can't provide that but you literally need so so what happens then so what happens if you're like we're trying to get the kinfolk of these grandor back and we found a bunch of them in the Verbena summer realm. So maybe this Fera isn't quite as extinct as we thought it was. So who would oppose this? This is one of the cases where I think science and magic collide into each other in a absolutely delicious way. What other kind of big types of bygones do we have? The other huge obvious one is cryptids, mm -hmm. right? So you've got your Mothman and your Bigfoot and your Yeti and your Chupacabra, your random thing that is a folk tale sort of kind of a, like a random thing created today Loch Ness monster in some ways is a cryptid is it or is it a dinosaur hmm. like it, it could be and lots of these things are not scientific there's no proof that they exist but they're not necessarily extinct unless you assume that the Loch Ness monster is an extinct dinosaur which is a thing. Yeah, there's not a scientifically agreed on level of evidence of their existence. Stories, secondary things, coincidences, and so on is a type of evidence. It merely hasn't passed that bar yet. Cryptids, I have a complicated relationship with because I do like the idea that if enough people believe a thing, it becomes real. So the Mothman didn't exist. That was originally a spotted owl or something like that. But all this Mothman starting, guess what? There's a Mothman now. <laughs> and I'm kind of a, a big fan of that. Another type of bygone we have are the supernatural species, your elves, your dwarves, your gnomes, and so on. That's fine. Then you have a lot of things in between the two. The Vost are introduced in bygone bestiary and is a race, a species of dead people caused by over-curious Russians that basically go into water at night, which is a 
the general rule apparently one should not do. And they have a ancient kingdom with its own laws. You have the sea bishop, which is a preternaturally smart Abe Sapien, which I guess is already preternaturally smart, that happens to be able to quote scripture. What are they? They in that different biology category, they could be magically sustained. We have the the, the traditional supernatural creatures. And then I think my favorite one, and for more information on those, please see our episode on Bygone Bestiary. My plan originally was to release this as the companion to that episode, and I will summarize the last two months as jo- for Josh and I as me going, ah! and Josh then going, ah! but you know what? Josh's door locks again. Everything is going to be okay. And uh, the last category is one I kind of find uh, fascinating of what I like to call legendary creatures. Josh, what are those? So legendary creatures are effectively common species that you could go out and find, but there's something unique, strange, extra, supernatural, big, amazing, whatever term you want to use about them, right? So like there is a particular crocodile that is in Egypt and it is a representative of the judges of Ma'at, right? So it is able to sense if someone's heart is heavier than a feather. That would be really neat because then you're able to use your crocodile, your little baby crocodile that you're carrying around to be like, that's enough on date. <laughs> and yeah, good. Hopefully you speak enough crocodile to figure that out. But like, you've also got things like a great ursid bear right that can pair bond two creatures so they act like a parent and child oh wouldn't this be a great thing for like you mage and your like wayward ward that you are taking care of and now you are spiritually and actually parent and child and isn't that amazing to be able to have that connection or a rooster that imparts resistance to supernatural fear for one full day this is an interesting thing if you tie it into like norse myths about i'm gonna say cocks and different roosters and things like that because there's lots of things that would make a lot of sense so if you go into a random farmstead in denmark and you're like here is a random rooster that i've discovered oh i hear it crow and now i'm not uh, i'm not hurt by any of the supernatural fear for 24 hours cool presence doesn't work on you you mm-hmm. are not repelled by the overwhelming fear of a, a outsider thing and i just like that you're dealing with a spawn star squid and they're like why why flee you not mortal and you're just holding up this chicken um, right. <laughs> the superpower of mages is we do our homework yeah <laughs> And but what I think about co- is cool about these is they're not overtly yeah. supernatural, right? You don't have to necessarily know, hey, this per- you're, you can't look at this rooster and go, that is a magical rooster, right? You can't look at this particular uh, opossum. There's an opossum I'm talking about in a second and say, that is clearly magical, right? But there's something about it that is clearly more than normal, mm-hmm. right? So there is a, a a specific biological inspiration the possum the opossum the beautiful wonderful animal found in both north america and in australia this technically they're different but anyway the point is they are wonderful the lenape have a story of how a possum tried to move the sun and after it was found to be too close it burnt all the hair particularly off of its hands and its face and stuff like that so this is uh supposed to be a story of like bravery and or vanity or strength or there's lots of different like cultural bits of it right yeah and the idea here is that we looked at one creature and we said how many different cultural associations could it have i have Mm -hmm. a possum in my backyard which my spouse and i uh, have named vernon archimedes is the norway rat and we're just like how many different possum associations are there and we have this this lenape tail Uh, on the biological association we can make is possums tend to give birth to twins so to me you could try and reach out to find the true possum to find your avatar companion or your lost twin twin or your soulmate or a mage that shares the same a- essence if you had a character that wanted to treat to search out a possum spirit to increase an attribute or ability uh, josh what would you tie to the possum as you are also a possum enthusiast oh clearly charisma because possums are incredibly cute they're kind animals also so there's lots of things you, you could manipulation depending on how you use that as a attribute on your character sheet could do that i even say appearance but that's just my preference but they are 
also an animal that is, as I mentioned, present in North America, present in Australia. Then you've got a path of the wick sort of situation, a connection between those two places where you go into a, a possum hollow and now you can walk between there and the outback. Super cool, super random. Why not? Yeah. Right. Or reach into a possum's pouch and pull out something from the other side of the world. Yes. And just to note, we fully recognize that the bushtail possum and the North American uh, and the Virginia possum are related, but they are not the same creature. It's not like you will see the same fang fest if you do it. There are a number of possums in Philadelphia, and I think I would go to them for as the embodiment of not quite grim determination, but uh, I guess we have to do this because whenever there's a possum walking down the street and I'm walking down after it, it'll it'll run for me for a couple houses and then look behind and see that I'm still there and be like, oh, we got to keep this bullshit up. So to me, a possum would be what I would call on for some sort of incredibly boring extended ritual. And that would be the creature or brood that I would go to. One of the ones that I found that was kind of interesting is to the Aztecs, the possum stole fire from the dark beings who prevented it and wanted to keep the world dark. So like Possumetheus or Propossumtheus or something like that. And one of the recurring stories is the idea of the Virginia possum has a relatively hairless tail. Why? And in the story Josh told, it was because the possum tried to move the sun. And in this case, it is because it had wrapped its tail around fire to conceal it. The possum became a symbol for thieves, but so often is the raccoon. And I like the idea that the raccoon represents selfish thievery and the possum represents a kind of just thievery. So the possum is the, the Prometheus or the Robin Hood of it. So you could have the guild of the possum versus the guild of the raccoon, both of which are seeking out these legendary creatures to aid in their ability or dealing with certain umbral broods. And they have a age-old um, hatred of each other. I could see the possum as there are some who believe that all true wisdom is in some way quote-unquote stolen from God. Paul Erdish was of this belief that all the world's most particularly beautiful mathematical proofs were in a book of math that, um, that uh, the term that Paul Erdish used for God was SF, the Supreme Fascist. <laughs> yeah, um, mm, wow. Yeah, Paul Erdish was a pretty fascinating character. He said life was a game. I'm going to mess up the quote slightly. Every time you fail to help someone, God gets two points. Every time you hurt someone, God gets four points. There is no way to win, but we can try and keep the score low. And I like the idea that like your avatar is Paul Erdish, and every time he gets a particularly elegant proof, it is due to possum sneaking into heaven and stealing this thing from the book. And this is just going possum cultural associations. And I find mm -hmm. it absolutely fascinating how different cultures view different things. And just a little bit of work with that can quickly break those common associations we have. And I think make our games much more interesting. It magifies a relatively normal common thing that you're like, hey, and here is all of the symbolism mm -hmm. that it is evoking, all the connections that it's providing. So we went down a, a possum hole for a while <laughs> yeah. there. Let's bring it back to the question of how do bygones survive, right? Mm -hmm. How do they still exist? Um, the obvious one is remote area, right? So these are places where clearly bygones have not actually disappeared. They're just hidden. You know, the thylacine in Tasmania is still there, even though we haven't been able to prove that it is because it just hid well in the jungles. Like, okay, possibility there, right? Or like young Persian firebirds, right? Uh, the Malad Tower in Iran, they, they uh, that's like a thousand foot tower. It's huge. And you've got these birds that you just cannot see on there. Well, of course you can't see them because you're not crawling up there to go check them out, right? So that makes sense. But there are lots of different things like that around the world that could work. Um, there are um, the the islands of, of Tristan Duncunha. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. They're part of the UK, and it's a six-day boat ride from the UK to those islands. Yeah. But the southern Kelpie happens to happily live there, shifting, shifting shapes, right, and playing tricks on people. And because it's so out of the way you're not going to randomly come across one unless you're looking for them and as a mage of course you're looking for them because they have something that you want mm -hmm. there are if you just look up remotest places you get a lot of weird answers uh, pitcairn island is mostly inhabited by descendants of people that were left during the mutiny of the bounty 
and they're just used to the Pacific gnome that lives on the island. And they simply refer to them as the short folk. And they go about their business of uh, exploring the uh, trails beneath the island and they happen to be particularly good at spotting the growth of nephondic labyrinths and suddenly that's a thing so in addition to that they could still be around but they are in disguise and this is another idea we get in gods and monsters that yes that person is a sphinx they look like a normal person they just happen to also be a sphinx so you now have questions of how do they stay around and so on and so forth, but there's any number of ways to kind of answer that. They, it is suggested that these are particularly common in East Asia, or at least those are the big examples that we get. So maybe you have a mob enforcer that is a hulking brute that is literally an ogre, and if she doesn't her sharpen her teeth upon the bones of a mortal once a month, she will die. The canny litigator is a literal kitsune who finds the courtroom to be the closest thing to the stylized social combat of Edo court intrigue. He needs to fabricate a new new law and convince another judge or litigator that it exists every few weeks or begin to lose their magical nature. So you could also have them still be a being that is around, but has to feed on quintessence. So these are creatures that are probably going to find a node or something like that to feed on or hang around mages as their familiars or things like that. So um, a, a hellhound protecting the opening of a, a barrow that goes to the Dark Umbra. Um, it's, of course, sustained by pathos of those who wander in and out of the underworld. Like, totally makes sense. You've got a Kerberos connection. You've got all kinds of different Irish myths you could lean on here. There's a lot right. of dogs that protect hell. That was one I didn't I, I didn't expect a lot. I also like the fact that there's a difference between the the dogs that are like, no, 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 the living can come and go. I just need to prevent the dead from coming out. And then the ones that are the opposite, where it's like, no, 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 no. We can't let the mortals in because the dead have all the cool shit. So I, I like that we get both variants running around. Absolutely. There's lots of fun stuff to play mm -hmm. with there. I'm also thinking of also in the same vein, like there's a, a pair of Lamassu uh, that are, have promised to guard the Ishtar gates of Sargon II in ancient Assyria. And because they stick to their word, they are still there, right? And and they they guard these gates in both Hila, Iraq, and in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And occasionally they go back and forth and trade places, right? have all of these different connections again you can use like paths of the wick and things like that to connect these two places these beings that share this connection but then they're also sharing the quintessence that connected between those two places right there is this literal vein that is connecting them and the reason we keep bringing up the paths of the wick is that they are never well defined it is suggested that it is a way of kind of moving through reality in a different way that doesn't quite Require correspondence and doesn't quite require spirit at high levels that allows you to quickly traverse an area with a certain degree of danger. But more importantly, they're never really defined. So if you ever need that magical shortcut, that is always there. So you have the, these, these Lamasu that periodically trade places. Lamasu are forbidden from talking to each other on the job. So they hold these massive parties um, to kind of pass around gossip and tales of what they've seen during their five years of guarding half of the Ishtar Gate. Uh, mind you, there are a number of copies of Ishtar uh, of the Ishtar Gate. I, I pick that as an example because it is something that periodically kind of tours or copies of it are made. The British Museum probably has four of them somehow. I don't know. I, least, it's yeah. it's mm -hmm. You can do real cool things when you have an empire during the finder's keepers phase of colonialism. So it's like, hey boss, we found a statue. It weighs over 15 tons. It's crusted with jewels. Everyone here says it's really important, right? Put it on the boat. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> we will do archaeology. Exactly. Yeah. Ah, archaeology. Yes. <laughs> um, we also get the idea that there are some creatures that can just kind of forage for what they need. The constantly hunting Wumpus uh, roots through the Andean towns of Ecuador and is able to kind of scrounge up enough tass and quintessence to survive. No two people agree on its form, which brings up the question of so how do you how do you find the darn thing? Why doesn't it just create a big bonfire and then eat yeah. the fire? <laughs> yeah. Don't you have Prime 3 and access to gasoline? <laughs> um, so, yeah. So uh, we've talked about a couple of different things, but like there's also this idea of they could have survived by going into the Umbra and occasionally they have to come back to reality, right? So they, they pop back and forth just enough one way or the other 
to sustain themselves somehow. Um, dragons do this, right? They go, um, they create a lair that is in both the physical realm and in the umbra, and occasionally they have to slide back onto Earth to solidify, shed their skin. Maybe there's lots of fun things you could do if you're like, here, I'm bringing a dragon to the story. This is how it works, right? Um, another one, uh, the Vulture of Oblivion, you know, was entrusted with seeing the orderly arrival of Armageddon uh, to make way for the next better Earth, right? The, uh, the cycle of, of existence. Um, the creature is a bird with 50 foot wings. It simply looks like an airplane, right? Uh, but every 25 years to a century, it glides in a spiral around the Earth to see that the decay of all things is going as it's supposed to check i'm doing my job um but as it glides its magic fades and the bird shrinks and it becomes the size of a hummingbird by the time it reaches the south pole it goes throughout its journey shedding great feathers um, and these allow any mage that grabs them potent visions of the future this is a neat idea right there's lots of things you can do with that um but it has to hibernate in between those eras of cycle and destruction so thinking like i think it specifically hibernates during the apex of history that's when it finds those moments to just rest yep. it, I mean, the total number of times the apex of history has been mentioned in mage 2 3 once it is indicated as a place that just makes everyone sad the second time it is where vormos gets the pasupada astra to destroy the cosmos and third here it's where bird sleeps another path that is lesser considered and is kind of kind of woven into what is listed above is they have been managed to be embraced by the culture and are no longer consider a bygone in some areas it could be the case that there are particularly particular birds the, the persian odzvud um, is just kind of this parrot looking thing that is considered to be particularly wise and it is hard to differentiate between this is a bygone that will experience unbelief if it's moved from its reality zone and it's really hard to keep in captivity and nothing else has the appropriate climb so there are we are often informed by our western culture to kind of neatly put these creatures in different bins but other cultures and societies put the barrier between the natural and supernatural in different places we have the idea that the jinn are just another type of creature out there that is a blend of spirit and being so in a weird way werewolves and uh like ifriti are in some way related which is a crossover book i didn't know i wanted until just now the other idea is that these creatures could just have some sort of immunity to unbelief um and if i get my stuff together i actually wrote a piece of short fiction that um should be available to executive producers about a uh, an umbrood of some sort kind of making an arrangement with a mortal professional to kind of help them keep their stuff together in the face of unbelief. So hopefully, so any more thoughts on kind of the how umbroods could survive? I don't think so. I think we have this outstanding question, though, about what if or why do bygones give up their bodies? Like, is that that like that's a possible direction or of questions that, that exists here with these things so why terry yeah this is interesting because the idea is they they donned a supernatural body and this suggests a couple of things either to exist in the umbra you have to have a magical body of some sort but that doesn't seem to be the case for instance horizon stronghold of hope has 10,000 or 20,000 mortals that live in Concordia. And to the best of our knowledge, they are not spirit entities. They can go back and forth between the mortal world. We also get the idea that there are extinct creatures in any number of umbral realms that are not spiritual. And then if they are spirits, why aren't they just another kind of umbrood? Why do they come back? And so why did they give up their regular bodies or what does it mean? One idea of this is that quintessence could be easier to find than whatever ecological niche they need. So true rocks could only feed on the massive diamonds found within the crags Mount Kof. When Mount Kof left the material world, some of them followed the mountain. Others adapted their diet to quintessence because they could no longer find enough massive diamonds to survive. Maybe they found a patron spirit to protect them. Uh, the problem of Luru is a kind of antelope whose horns made a plaintive noise to hold off grief as they ran to the houses to collect the bodies of the just dead across 
the Zagros Mountains. As worship of the Uzadas faded, so did their charge, uh, and they agreed to join the brood of Crow, and others joined Whippoorwill, not knowing the latter's tied to the worm. Whippoorwill is tied to the worm, right? It okay. is, yeah. Whippoorwill is one of the major Black Spiral Dancer totems. Got it. What other reasons do you think a creature might give, give up their bodies? So uh, switching to a supernatural body gave them some sort of power. Like, uh, imagine Komodo dragons. Like, they are cool, right? But they don't breathe fire, as far as we know. Um, some <laughs> ancient lizard They don't yet creatures... breathe fire. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> But some ancient lizard creatures chose to shed their meat bodies so that they could gain the ability to fly and get a breath weapon because they were like, hell yeah, yeah that exactly. would be cool. <laughs> You're like, yeah, um, you have to give up your normal life and you have infinite access to the umbra. Do you make that like, what? I couldn't hear you. They, you. You make it sound like there is a downside in this story. <laughs> There's a choice. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I'm, uh, yes, <laughs> I'm there. They could free themselves to go to that umber, right? Like they're 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 like, hey, this is uh, picturing a thing. Uh, the greater northern seagull uh, once darkened the skies of the Arctic, but it became bored of the vast expanse of icy north, and some became sea eagles, while others moved to the ocean of possibility at the edge of the Vulgate, and where beyond unknown thoughts coalesce. Why not? Yeah. Right. It seems pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, a lot of these do kind of depend on the creatures kind of being smarter mm -hmm. than they are. Mm -hmm. And I do like the idea that there are animals that have a lot of either latent intelligence or that they're smarter than necessarily they let on. Or again, it could be only a portion of the population has this. And they are kind of the material version of the brood mothers, as it were, uh, in, in werewolf where, yeah, deers aren't ne individual aren't necessarily smart but the spirit deer is is quite intelligent although probably skittish is there is there a big book of totem running around out there there is not there really should okay. be because that would be an that would be a thing people would buy uh, yeah it would be <laughs> anyway go make that on the storyteller's vault someone listening to this not me Another thing that we have is we have a whole bunch of bygones that are mentioned throughout Mage that are listed to be in some new form. Josh mentioned the idea of unicorns undergoing the changeling way and either there being a person where you look at their chimerical self and suddenly that's a that's a unicorn or the version I like that they have undergone the changeling way with horses. And now we have this idea that horse souls um, uh, have seemings and so on. And that is a an interesting complication. There's a type of like celestial horse within Exalted where that have like God mixed into them and they're mm -hmm. highly sought after because when Exalts use their power, the horses are like, my dad's a God, this ain't shit. Um, and I just like the idea of that being the case. And my mage version of that would probably be since mage doesn't get to do things that unironically directly cool it would have to be either a, a donkey or a pony that were god-blooded so like yes you can charge into battle in your avatar god form but it's going to be on a shetland pony it's a very strong shetland pony but it's a pony nonetheless god form spirit pony another one we have is the sphinx that the sphinx fled to the digital web and there's a couple of interpretations it's one, it is the realm of information, and that is where the Sphinx decided to, to line up. Another is the idea that uh, the Sphinx, the Lamassu, the Rock, could all have been denizens of Mount Kof, and when Mount Kof left reality, instead of going to the High Umber or something like that, wound up getting stuck in this zone of the digital web, which is listed within Mage Continuity as being on top of the gauntlet, which I, I think makes it cool and is never quite explored and maybe explains why mortals can go there dragons in human form are kind of suggested. Uh, there have always been a uh, humans that have a propensity towards hoarding things, seem to age very slowly, and can possibly render themselves invisible and capable of flight and have some sort of uh, breath weapon. What, what other kind of interpretations of bygones do you think could exist in the world of darkness or being like, oh, this is kind of a modern update to blank? The modern ones is an interesting question, right? Like, is Slender Man a bygone, right? Like, that is a, a new cr creation of the internet, but 
this and say the Minecraft called Hero Brine. It's similar to Slender Man, is this this weird kind of creature that seems to come out of nowhere. Um, but it is this urban legend within Minecraft. What if Hero Brine were to be something like that, a bygone in real life? Also, their Mothman. We, we talked about Mothman quite a bit earlier, uh, but uh, that is a thing. Paul Bunyan and John Henry, these American like folktale legend things, are they bygones, or is just Blue the big giant uh, cow a bygone? But it would be interesting if. Johnny Appleseed, who was a real person, but the legend of him has become this kind of bygone creature that is all kinds of interesting things. There is a wonderful book called Myths of the Forgotten Land or something like that. That is the wrong name. It's by Charles Skinner. Um, it's a wonderful book about American folklore, lore, particularly um, myths and legends of our land, myths and legends of our land. That's what it is. Um, right after colonization so it includes some native american stories as well to pretty much like 1930 it, it includes this conglomerate conglomeration of american folktales um excellent source for like new bygones um there are dwarves supposedly in dunderberg mountain in new york for example as like a thing that you could pull things from oh neat and that is available on Project Gutenberg, and I will include a link to that in the show notes. And any time that we can add a thing that I like adding distinctly American and distinctly local stuff, and that doesn't just and isn't just a misinterpretation of the sacred beliefs of native peoples, thumbs up for that <laughs> for not doing that. Um, I also like the idea that contemporary urban legends bear old mantles. Slender Man is just the newest incarnation of He Who Stalks the Unwary, which is an ancient pre-Slovak creature that has found a new way to manifest. To me, this creates incentives for weird old creatures to invest in creepypasta or to make deals with writers or tastemakers. Mothman was uh, He Who Stalks the Destruction uh, of Edifices, and it was behind the collapse of the Point Pleasant uh, Bridge. And again, it was just an emanation that somebody made to secure their hollow or made their glen. And this kind of blurs that notion of what a bygone is as we are now combining the material aspect with the spirit aspect. We have a lot of options and they're all interesting and weird. And kind of one of the recommendations I have for this is to consult the game, The Esoterrorists. There is the uh, Book of Unremitting Horror, which has a bunch of horror creatures that you can use to include here. But basically the idea is enough kind of belief can start thinning the gauntlet and that there are terrible creatures that esoterrorists are trying to have infiltrate for their own nefarious purposes. It's also nice because it's a game where you unremittingly work for the good guys. And it is also one of those things where it's like, yeah, you'll probably go down in the line of work, but it kind of has that XCOM thing where it's like, well, okay, roll up another character. We're going to continue with this story, which I, which I kind of think is fun. I like the idea that Kerberos still exists, but it's given an upgrade. Instead, it has three heads that are tuned to TV shows, the ch videos that keep the dead in line. I will. I got that from a, a thing I'd stumbled upon on uh, Tumblr, and I'll include that in the show notes as well. Uh, any other thoughts on how to use bygones in a game before we get to some listener questions? We haven't really discussed the how to use bit. I'm just going to talk a quick reference to use there's a mm -hmm. thing called the magimundi bestiary which i helped work Neat. on there's a fifth edition D D and pathfinder version of it it is effectively a monster manual of things that you could use as bygones right i think we have actually talked lots of story hooks and things like that there's lots of ways to use these in your game they should always be weird they should always be interesting they should be macguffins or help you push the plot along in one form or another which i think the weird in capital w should be what drives your mage stories that's how i would use them the big thing to me is that there is always kind of a thread to human belief. One of the questions we got is how do we incorporate more mermaids into mage? Uh, to me, they now exist on the internet and do kind of a form of catfishing where they seduce people online and drag them to their financial ruin or get 
at the, who eventually meet up and are then killed. So I also like the idea of inverting tropes instead of like some poor kid being lost at the hands of someone. It is now a middle level executive who really thinks they found the love of their life. And it turns out to be a mermaid who drowns them and dumps their body in the Hudson River. And that is what sustains them. I like the question of what are the monstrous things we will do to sustain ourselves, which is an interesting recurring theme. And is there a safe way to deal with that? Another question we have is Gods and Monsters, page 199, gives a system for unbelief, which is extraordinarily brutal. What do you use instead? I generally want to have three things. What is the thing the creature is particularly vulnerable to? And it is generally going to be something surprisingly mundane. Kerberos can literally be killed by a house cat, say, or something like that, but it needs to be a, a purebred Abyssinian or something like that. The thing that they do to kind of stay sub rosa to maintain themselves, to scavenge from quintessence, is their community of belief that they go from. So do you kill the creature by cutting it off from the node? Do you kill creature by disrupting its tie to the community? And then finally, what does it look like or how does it become vulnerable when it goes loud? Uh, when Kerberos does reveal himself to be a true three-headed hellhound, what does the cleanup after that look like? What is the recovery period? Yes, Kerberos has the ability to express himself as this hellhound and chase down your demonic nefondi agility in writing foe, but now you have to guard the gates of hell for the next three days while Kerberos recovers. So it is kind of that that system of trade-off. Yeah, the system listed is brutal where you're taking aggravated damage like every hour or something like that, and it's kind of ridiculous. But on the flip side, it kind of explains why there's not a lot of them around. Um, another key thing to to me is to define how close to contact with mortals do you need to be? Is it something where they literally need to be on a subway car? Is being uh, on the 10th story of a building far enough to get them away? Um, do they just need to be near a particular object that ties them to it? I always try and come up with a justification. Um, a question that I think you are particularly well suited to do and when we'll close after this is uh, Rich Bastard's Guide to Magic is an interesting chantry where they have started a Manticore breeding program do you think attempts to preserve this is just philanthropy or is there a utility to keeping around how do we get more bygones if we done want them yeah so I actually wrote the section on the Manticores and this Manticore breeding program the reason being that I had included in drafts that didn't get into the final version was that they produce magical products that you need that as particularly as a hermetic you need the barb off a manticore or you need hair off of the manticore's mane to produce specific magical effects and so by breeding and raising and training manticore you are able to both one have a really good protector a, a guard dog for lack of a better term that no one's going to want to mess with and you have all of these magical components that you can use that maybe give you tasks or whatever thing. But in the end, it is a thing that is useful to you. Um, to me, I personally generally take the view that bygones just try and stay out of mortal sight because by doing so, takes a little bit of time but they will get crushed by unbelief in some form or another and those that aggravated system i think is fairly good but i love the idea that mages are like we have sanctum we have places where we can hide these things and we can get all of the great things we want out of them why can't our secret world exist where we are breeding manticore or dragons or you know salamanders or uh, whatever it is that we are intentionally protecting and sustaining and then spreading around the world. And if I were a somewhat philanthropic mage, sure, I might be like, I want to protect this nearly extinct creature. That is totally a valid point. But they're also getting something out of it. And I think that's very magey where you're like, of course, I'm protecting this thing. Oh, it also poops, you know, golden eggs. So, yeah. Yay. And I also like the moral question of what should nature's portion be? So what if it is the case that we do have a manticore breeding program? Half of them go back out into the world. Half of them get processed to use what is the common term of art. And manticore have intelligence of two or three, maybe? Right. Oh, that, mm -hmm. 
And uh, I think that, to me, the interesting part of the ethical issues it raises. I tend to kind of eschew too clever by half solutions because it's one of those things where if you could just have a Manticore meeting progr- uh, breeding program, has it already happened and why did it go sideways? So the analogy I will use is twofold. One, there are a lot of bacteria that we don't actually know how to raise in the lab. There just seems to be things they need, and we're just not quite sure what it is. So maybe this Manticore breeding program works, but it happens to be because they are near a node that has this particular vengeful or spiteful or venomous essence Mm -hmm. that they don't realize that it kind of works. The other one is, so the the rye stones or or the face stones of the Yap Island are these massive stones that are used as currency. And people are like, like, oh man, I could crash the economy. I would just go there with a dump truck, blah, blah, blah. That's not how it works. Artificially generated, as it were, things that do not represent intense amounts of labor are not valued highly as stones. I also love the fact that there is this uh, fiat checking system where you now have representations that indicate your access to a stone. And it's like, oh, wow, this is, we immediately reinvent debt-based currency whenever we are given the opportunity. And I just thought that was super cool. But um, it's one of those things where the moment you are able to do a feeding, uh, a breeding program for it, it is no longer a true manticore. There is something, Mm. um, the venom just doesn't work or something like that there are any number of creatures that we just can't quite raise in captivity we can tame cheetahs we cannot domesticate them we haven't found a way for them to breed that way so it could be one of those things where it is just prohibitive and whatever you would want to use it for there is a better way to get to the same end where it's like yeah okay yeah you can harvest these Parts. And this, hey, I'll give it to you. It represents a two-point node. That's how much task you're regularly able to get from harvesting from it. You need resources seven to maintain this. Mm-hmm. It literally costs billions of dollars a year to keep the cops off your back, to keep the area stocked. The, each one of these eats 400 pounds of, of um, it has to be wild caught meat a day. In fact, manticores only eat other carnivores or something like that. So to me, there would always be a way to be like, you can do it. It's probably not worth it. Now, the cult of the manticore may want to go that, or the chosen of manticore, or the brood of manticore may be interested in it, but for the rest of us, there's just an easier way to get there. In the same way that we frequently talk about, oh, this effect is OP, and you're like, fear of gun. Right, right. <laughs> so that would be my my mention to it. And the entirely opposite sort of thing you could do is have a Joe Exotic manticore farm and it just be the thing that no one knows about until suddenly they do. <laughs> okay. I like and that. And then you're like, oh, oh, what is this thing? And that's an interesting story. So your characters are at a, uh, a mortal soiree where some esoteric uh, petro oligarch has a exotic pet. And you're like, pretty, pretty sure that's a manticore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and people are like, <laughs> yeah, I got out of a Craigslist. And you're like, uh, I have questions. I got um, it from this random farm in the yeah. middle of Tennessee. And you're like, that's, I'm sure that's not legal. <laughs> and, and and one last thing that kind of came up is what is the relationship between bygones and familiars? Can you have a bygone be a familiar? I would say per se, no. So familiar represents two different things. One, there is the familiar background on the character sheet and there's a bunch of abilities that come with it. Uh, one of them is the ability to eat paradox, so on and so forth. Bygones are the opposite. They are particularly vulnerable in most cases to paradox, so I would not have them do that, but they can certainly be a three-point ally that acts like familiar. So with a familiar, you're taking a spirit, you're creating a body for it, and having in some way it be inhabited, or you're constructing a body, and then you're giving it sapience or something like that. With bygone, all those parts are already out there. I would probably represent that with the allies background. Now, this is this, this represents the difference between familiar in the core book, where it just has boom, 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 boom. These are the things you can see through its eyes. It's each quintessence. Is it perfectly fine to use the familiar system in Gods and Monsters to build one and call that a familiar? Y- yes, but it is just important to me that a bygone really already has a physical body and you can bond yourself to it as opposed to a traditional familiar which is probably more of a spirit thing that you construct a vessel for that inhabits that and certain benefits come with that that's interesting terry i don't think that's how the writers conceptualized it oh okay but i, I think I that's may- interesting yeah <laughs> <laughs> but I guess our TLDR, if you want to do further reading about this, is going to be Gods and Monsters is a big one. Bygone Bestiaries. Um, the book Josh mentioned are going to be in the show notes. The Magimundi Bestiary, as well as um, Stories of Our Land or Creatures of Our Land. Let me get the actual pronunciation of that. And Myths and Legends of Our Own Land. Josh, anything else that you would recommend? Or alternatively, where can we find what you're up to? 
if you're interested in talking to me, I used to tell people to go to the Bluebird app. No longer do that. I am on Mastodon uh, as Josh Heath. I am on the Facebooks. So um, if you're interested in communicating with me, you can do so on the Werewolf the Podcast Facebook. And uh, that is the easiest way to find me. Awesome. Josh, thank you again so much for your time. And I look forward to co-hosting episodes with you in the future. Of course. Thank you, Terry. This has been Mage the Podcast, where even if you got a lot of work done and got a weird new haircut, we totally not target our unbelief at you. This episode was made possible by Oracle Near Patterson, who resists unbelief by blending in seamlessly with mortals in a life-size beaver costume. Oracle Josh Hillerup, who resists unbelief by taking on the form the consensus expects by always having a four-leaf clover in their hair. Oracle Buck Gregory, who resists unbelief by eating tasty, tasty quintessence in the form of exotic flavors of Takis. Oracle the Crew of Erebus, who resist unbelief by making a dark pact with a forgotten Albanian forest god. Oracle Mikhail, who resists unbelief unbelief through constantly yelling, I'm totally not a bygone. Oracle Christopher Phillips, who resists unbelief by, you know, just vibing. And Oracle Jay Widener, who resists unbelief by always playing the didgeridoo. Additionally, I'd like to thank our other executive producers, Alex, Alexia, Anders S., Andrew Edelstein, Anand Badurfi, Berto, Blaze Hebert, Blake Ryan, Boogers, 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 Brad of the Blue, Bryce Perry, Chris B., Daniel Cuppin, Daniel Scribner, Dan Svensson, David Roy, Darren Hiss, Osborne, Derek Sedmsek, Fragger Rock, George Laura, Guy Conan Stewart, Ia Bull, Jason Kennedy, Jason Vines, Jason W. Briggs, Jay Gatsby, Jeff Brin, John Magnuson, Julian Andes, Lulz and Stuff, Joshua Heath, Kathleen Halperin, Chris Kinner, Leslie Weatherstone, Matthew Proyle, Michael Creedle, Michael Parker, Morgan Aran, Nathan Weaver, Nibero, Nikita Klamanoff, Oliver Schindler, Patrick McNamara, Patrick Mulder, Puka G, Rachel Grace, Ralph Scheinhammer, Ricardo, Richard Bat Brewster, Robart the Robot, Rob H, Ryan Kendi, Samuel Tobin, Sean Gallagher, Stephen Carton, Thrice Great, William Connolly, William Martin, and Zach Rules. Our EP shout out is to Alex, who I assume is the namesake of the adaptive learning software developed at UC Irvine in 1994 with the support of the National Science Foundation. In elementary school, we had an adaptive learning computer lab before the advent of Alex, which I found constantly infuriating because it always set itself to be just beyond what you could do. Its intention was to force you to learn, but I found this absolutely infuriating as it had no downward adaptive setting. So if you started doing poorly, it just kept getting harder. And while the ding-dongs around me were learning about how to, like, count in fourth grade, I was learning synthetic substitution having had no prior background in algebra. Instead of me constantly getting appropriate challenges, I instead gave me a hatred of white Macintosh computers and eventually instilled them in me as a potential source of quiet. Alex, thank you for not being a Justin learning machine, and thank you for your support. Rather listen to us on YouTube, search Mage the Podcast on YouTube to find our full library there. If you super liked this episode or super didn't, drop us a line at magethepodcast at gmail.com or at magethepodcast on Twitter. We have a hop and Discord community at discord.me slash mage the podcast. If you like us, please give us a review on the platform you're choosing or tell a friend about us. Also go to magethepodcast.com for show notes and all of our previous shows. Now go change reality. Bye.